these are our speakers you can see here we sent out flyers for you guys Kim Gandy um, actually I won't tell you how long we've known each other but Kim and I uh, uh, have been around transplant for quite some time Kim is an MD PhD physician scientist entrepreneur and I thought it'd be a great idea to bring her in and let her tell her story so without further ado Dr. Gandy, come on up and tell your story. So first of all, Henry, congratulations for getting this started and getting this going. I think um, these types of organizations are, uh, I've watched it sort of take off. Um, I spent some time in Denver where some of the home organizations are. And, um, congratulations to you with your busy schedule for also uh, working on getting this going, but I think it can be a, a pretty dramatic sort of um, help for an area. So let's see here. There we go. And we talked about today being a little bit, um, shall I say, more informal with the presentation and going through a little bit more of the story of how we as entrepreneurs got to this particular um, venture, shall we say, and uh, I run a digital health company that makes it easier for patients to understand and follow their prescribed health regimens. And when we talk about um, how I got to this particular point, um, I was previously a pediatric congenital and heart surgeon and started this venture actually to tackle a problem that was uh, killing the patients that I treated and over 125,000 patients in the United States every year. As you can imagine, making that transition from a surgical um, sort of field into a field of entrepreneurial um, endeavors was a multi-step process, but I can tell you it took at least three what I would call hits before I actually um, decided to make the transition. And the first hit is not this kid, but is somebody that he represents which was um, a 17-year-old kid that we lost when, um, for understandable reasons, he failed to take his medications after a heart transplant um, in what resulted in his death. So he had done all those things that we as a transplant organization thought were the Hail Mary that we were successful. He had gone through this transplant, still graduated from high school, moved out from home, got a job, started college. But somewhere over a 48-hour period, he didn't take his medications. And some people can get away with that, even for some organs. But for a heart transplant, for somebody that has antibodies, this particular kid wasn't able to do that. And so this began in a very long, very extensive, very emotional process for not only the, for us, for the entire ICU, where we lost him, which literally was a problem with him not being able to take his medications for a period. So that was sort of one thing, and unfortunately as clinicians, we, we oftentimes, we see these things, but it's not really what we're focusing on, and it's not necessarily what a surgeon always follows, and we keep moving on. You put your head down, you, you go on and about your business. And then I moved to Kansas City, and I was supposed to be starting a pediatric heart transplant program, and um, there was some resistance to that, and, there's, and that's understandable. Some of it is a lifestyle change. Um, for those of us that are in transplant, you know, if you go from you know, leaving a hospital every day at three or four to, oh, I'm going to be on call all the time. Um, that's kind of a big change. But I realized since there was resistance from the nurses that it was deeper than that. And so I sat down with a group of nurses to understand exactly what the reasons were that they didn't want a transplant program. And the comment to me was, why would you want to start a transplant program when these kids are going to get to adolescence, quit taking their meds, and die? Well, that's not what happens everywhere but understandably that's what these nurses were seeing. These are kids that were transplanted in St. Louis or transplanted in Denver, moved there without their caregivers, lost that connection, and then quit taking their meds and they didn't do well. So those, those are actually the patients they saw. So that was what I would call hit number two. And then hit number three was being at a meeting that I would call the, it's called the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplantation, which is our sort of major meeting for the year. We're at a dinner afterwards where we have just given the, the semi-annual sort of educational course for all of our group to take, and we've designed all the courses, and we're talking about the next one. And I can remember everybody at the table thought that the major problem 
that we were facing in transplant was not adherence. And almost everybody there, except for one, uh, thought that it was somebody else's job. In other words, so this is what we thought was the biggest barrier for us taking care of our patients. Yet, we were all saying that, but that's not really what I do, it's somebody else's sort of problem. So, um, I can tell you that whenever we left that meeting with those transplant coordinators, we left that day, this was before the app sort of phase actually sort of really took hold as it has now. So this is five and a half years ago, where actually, believe it or not, that long ago, medical apps weren't as popular as they are now. They ballooned in two years after that. Um, and we left that meeting with the decision that we were going to design applications to speak to patients in ways that they like to be spoken to. And one of the things that also happened whenever I stepped outside of the transplant sort of realm is I had no idea that there were 150 million people in the United States on chronic medications. So in other words, that's half the American population. Um, I'd had the blinders on, so I really didn't pick that up. And that over half of these are not adherent with their prescribed regimens. And so this is a process that results in blindness, pneumonia, limb loss, coma, and over 125,000 deaths in the United States every year. There are $300 billion lost just in the pharmaceutical industry alone from patients not filling their prescriptions. So you tag on to that um, the issues with uh, basically um, increased hospitalizations, increased readmissions, it is likely double that, although those numbers are a little bit more hard to come by. But there is hope on the horizon for us changing that. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time here because I do think this is important in this particular arena. So pay for performance is here. So I don't really care if we call it Obamacare, if we call it Trump care. I do care, but, um, but if whatever you call it, one of the tenets that we're all hoping stays within the system is the, incident, is the issue of pay for performance. I'm going to tell you a little bit why from the innovation side. We all understand there are problems with the current models of paper performance. You know, everybody should not be evaluated the same if they're taking in the highest risk patients and others are not. And it's difficult to sort of set up those systems where we do that. But if you're trying to design systems that are encouraging innovation, what you need to have is systems that financially reward systems that use those innovations for cost containment and improving outcomes. It's something called, we call alignment of incentives. Because what I can tell you, if you do not have that, it will not be promoting innovation. So there are a lot of things that people are talking about. Everybody's talking about the exchanges and everything else. But of all the things that came out of this last movement, in my mind, this is the biggest thing that came out of it. And right now, nobody's talking about removing this component. What I'm hoping is that it improves and expands over the next, over the coming years. So we leveraged 25 years of experience in the clinical trenches, and we designed a platform for improving adherence, because data has shown of all the things that we can do to improve outcomes, improving adherence is one of the dominant things, even on a global scale. So the World Health Organization has come out with a proclamation that adherence is the, improving adherence is the most important thing we can do in health on a global scale. So we designed a branded HIPAA compliant mobile platform that provides tailored reminders, personalized education, and we'll go through that, and it's backed up by a rich reward system and a telemed profile. And I'm going to go through a little bit of how it works just from the outset. We start off with surveys and assessments to understand a patient's tastes, needs, and skill sets. The only thing we change in the clinical workflow is asking a clinician to tell us if they see a patient's knowledge level of their disease as one, two, or three. In other words, do they see a heart like a Valentine heart, or do they see a heart more like an anatomic structure? This may seem like a trivial thing, but it's actually a very crucial thing. 80% of the materials that we give patients when they walk out of the hospital or out of the clinic actually just goes on the table and is never evaluated again. So if we have the ability to personalize that material for a given patient and even follow how they engage with it electronically, that is a huge change in what we have been doing educationally. 
And with that data, we get through the surveys and the clinician assessments. We personalize an application for the patient, and we customize it for the given client, be that a hospital division, hospital system, or, um, uh, or a pharmacy. But underlying all this, sort of the secret sauce, is that we aggregate the critical elements of health adherence or engagement, and we bring that into a concise, actionable, easy to understand score. So this goes through the elements of what we call the POM score, which is our secret sauce, which is what we hope to be the FICO score of health engagement. So we're tracking whether they engage with the personalized education that we push out to them on a daily basis. There's a question associated with, the, with all this education. We follow how they do with that. Whether they attend their appointments as prescribed. Whether they use linked devices as prescribed. So in other words, if they step on the digital scale, if they use the activity tracker in the way that was prescribed. And whether they take the medications as prescribed. We track all of that. We turn it through what we call condition-specific algorithms. In other words, it's different for rheumatology than it is for transplant. And then we generate a score. And this score, it's a very simple idea. In fact, it's been in our solution from the beginning. Um, but what we found when we got out into the market was that was the appealing thing for most of the people that we presented this to. Because it becomes sort of an equal, equalizer across the health continuum. It becomes a very easy communication tool. So in other words, a clinician, a patient, a third party can understand how a patient is doing with a given regimen at any time. It's a dynamic sort of score. And the, the important part about this, as we sort of all know later, you can't prescribe further therapy effectively unless you know that they've done what you asked them to do at the last appointment. So it's a very simple um, sort of concept, but I think it resonates quite a bit um, with clinicians, and um, I might even ask uh, Henry to sort of make a comment about that sort of later on. The other thing that this does is this allows these health institutions to stratify patients with how they're doing. In other words, they know the patients that are where they want them to be, which is what we call the adherence zone. Those that are in what we call the watch zone. In other words, adherence isn't exactly where we want it to be, but we think they're still okay. And those that are in the danger zone. And we're able to do various levels of intervention based on where they are, although that can be customized for the intervention. So for instance, if they hit the watch zone, we can change the look and feel of the application, informed by information they gave us, so it's an intelligent system. If they actually enter the danger zone, we can trigger a call to a telemed institution. So we have both a telemed platform that we're interfaced with, and there are platforms that have clinicians behind them, depending on what the institution sort of wants. This entire system is bolstered by a rich rewards platform that's not just a one solution fits all. In other words, it's diverse. So it ranges anything from coupons for retail purchases um, to games and gamification, which are in some of our other platforms that we're bringing into this one now to premium rebates, which some of our um, uh, clients have the ability to offer. And this is where I was talking about the various levels of intervention. And this is just sort of a dra dramatic example that we can change the look and feel of the application, sort of this patient wanted to go on a vacation next. So in an attempt to sort of grab them before we lose them off the platform. There are many uh, solutions out there now in health engagement and health adherence. That's because it's such an important area. Um, but what we offer that's different from our competitors is one, um, the fact that the solution is more comprehensive than the other ones that are on the, uh, on the platform. And also, um, that scoring engine is very different. It's subtly different, but it's very different in very critical ways that fits seamlessly into currently existing clinical workflows. We're not asking anybody to change anything that they would do. We're not asking them to say, what somebody's activation level or what their emotional level is or any of the sort of soft things that we oftentimes think about might be important, but we're not changing workflows right now. And the other thing that's different is we have the ability to hit over 20 different chronic conditions. There are many solutions that say hit diabetes or would hit heart failure, but when you walk into an institution and you're trying to sell one of these solutions, they don't want 20 different solutions. It's, it's a lot for them to implement. They don't want to be maintaining one for diabetes and one for heart failure. They want the ability for you to be able to hit all those chronic conditions. The other thing that we're doing, you leverage the resources in your area. And what we're doing is unifying something called health information exchanges. And we've, uni we've gotten uh, a series that extend all the way from Denver to St. Louis. The major one that we're focusing on, however, is in Denver right now as we begin. And what I mean by that, 
a health information exchange was something that became very popular about five to ten years ago. But the one in Denver has become one of the most successful ones in the country with the idea that groups in that area will share information with it. Over 95% of the hospital beds in the state of Colorado report to this health information exchange. So I mean they're sharing data. That's unheard of across the sort of spectrum of health information exchanges. They also have the ability to sync data every 30 minutes, which is also unusual. So what that means for us is that we can interface with that health information exchange and be positioned to scale widely by easily taking in that biggest barrier that we have for implementation, that interaction with an electronic health record, off of the system. So that's a pretty big deal. We've been selected as the startup from a group of startups to uh, interface with Korea. That's moving along, and we're using that both to validate our system retrospectively and prospectively with our scoring engine. And then finally, one of the things that we're doing right now is we're also bringing in nutrition. Um, there are a variety of different sort of organizations um, or entities that nutrition is being um, better appreciated as a significant entity. So we have designed a pilot with the University of Nebraska where we're testing low sodium diets and the ability to adhere to those low sodium diets and bringing that into the FICO score as well, our FICO score of health adherence. And that's unusual and that's very different from all the scoring engines that are out there. So we have pilots in design or execution with all of the institutions on this particular um, slide. And um, we are working with a very experienced team that has both domain experience and drive. Our first three executives that you see there each have over 25 years of experience in their areas. Mine in healthcare. Our CTO has been in, both an investor and in tech for over 25 years and has run a successful software development firm. And Katie Nevin has been the Director of Product Development at groups such as WellTalk and Trizetta. Um, our advisors extend across the spectrum as well, from Esther Dyson, who is one of the most, um, probably the most famous um, person and woman in tech in this country, um, and with also experience with um, Telemed, DaVita, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and Hitachi with our advisors. So who do we sell to? So our customers are, um, we started off going after hospital divisions and hospital systems. That still is our wheelhouse and where we see us focusing. Um, but there are long sales cycles. Um, we are completing our pilots with those groups um, and we will continue to focus in that area. But in the interim, we've started um, selling to specialty pharmacies um, where that sales cycle does appear to be more on the realm of months um, to bring in early revenue and to allow us to enhance our system. Uh, that, that has become a pretty common model um, throughout these particular systems. Believe it or not, the um, specialty pharmacy systems, even when they're only serving 60, per 60 patients, uh, we can offer them at least a 20x ROI, um, where those ROIs in hospital divisions and systems are somewhere around 20 to, 20 to 30 times. It's a huge market. As I mentioned before, this is a, this is a sort of um, watered down sort of model. So, that number that everybody throws out, the $300 billion market health adherence, I've segmented it to uh, the market that we're actually going after. So if we just look at the 90 million people that are in our targeted chronic disease um, areas, and if we serve 3.5 million of those and take 3.9% of that target population, um, estimated revenues would be over 70 million within five years. Um, this is just the scaling that you can see for that. So there is a significant ramp up period, as you can imagine. And this is after we have uh, moved through our funding. But what I would also say is that on that same slide where I went through the number of institutions with whom we already have pilots in design or execution, um, including the hospital systems and groups such as ACA, if we were able to capture the hospital systems on that particular slide, that's already 5% of the market. Um, so we already have pilots in design or execution with groups that make those kind of numbers well within the realm of reality for us. So what have we done today? We've established a strong experienced team. In fact, that team has even transitioned from what I would call a team that was designed to develop the product to a team that's ready for scale. Um, we have an excellent product with traction in the market and pilots um, in place with big players, including HCA. And we're recognizing a player in the space. Um, we have already been in and out of a digital health accelerator. Um, we were last year selected by Village Capital as one of the 13 companies uh, within the United States to be part of something called Health 2016. 
And within the last several months, we have joined Startup Health, which is the Startup Health, which is the largest um, health entrepreneurial system within the United States. Uh, our near future milestones are to improve our interoperability. So, in other words, we're interfacing, as we discussed, with health information exchanges, with care management platforms, um, with groups such as Athena Health. Um, that's where we're now beginning to sort of focus our efforts to just uh, tee us up for beginning to scale. We're, we're spending a lot of time penetrating that specialty pharmacy market where we're seeing the, the ability to sort of bring in revenue more quickly and we're optimizing our POM score with retrospective data sets. I can tell you just the very issue of optimization of that POM score, there will be groups that are going to be interested in purchasing us from that standpoint alone. And so our ask, um, if you run uh, a group that serves patients such as this with complicated medical conditions, or you're affiliated with groups that treat these kind of patients, uh, we would like to speak with you um, because we believe that we can offer something that may save these patients' lives. Thank you very much. Um, well, I think the main way we knew, we, we anticipated that that was going to be, you know, possibly a long sales cycle, so it was just learned by, shall I say, doing, if you will, and it was the, um, we would have been able to stay the course of just moving with hospital divisions and moving into hospital systems if we had completed a large raise within that sort of period of time, but as the whole ecosystem has matured, one almost has to complete those pilots even before they're completing large raises in the Midwest. It's different on the coast. Um, and so uh, that was part of the reason that we did that. So what it, we are calling it sort of a transitional business model. And um, I actually just skipped one step. So the first group that we implemented with was small community practices, just to get somebody to use it, get it in patients' hands, because we knew that would be even a minimal sort of, you know, ramp up to the time. On that slide about the pharmacies and the health systems, how did you calculate the ROI? ROI. Yeah, so with the, I'll, I'll give you a specific example. So, um, one specialty pharmacy in this geographic area uh, makes $20 million uh, administering to 60 patients. So, that's $200,000 per year per patient. Um, that's with an adherence level of 50%. So if we're able to increase their adherence by uh, literally 10%, um, that is the ROI that we could give those guys. That one where I said the, um, the ROI for the hospital systems, that's using a Harvard-based model of um, ROI, uh, or return on investment, um, by uh, increasing adherence level by a minimal amount. And so if we increased the <laughs> adherence level just in heart failure by 10%, um, that would be the ROI that we would be able to offer the hospital in general, even though we would look to apply that across their entire system. So, you know, even in one division, we can offer a hospital, if they bought it for their entire hospital, they can recoup the cost by just implementing it in one division. Standardization and acceptance of the POM score, how is that going to work? speak to that in the future? Yeah, I think that's one of the things that we're the most excited about is because we have now um, secured this relationship with this health information exchange um, that we are validating it both with retrospective data and with prospective data. And I think that's a, it's a key thing and I haven't seen anybody else doing that yet. It kind of just, uh, I need to stop already. I just get it teed up. So, the, um, so in other words, we have divided it up now into what we call a predictive POM score and a dynamic POM score. The predictive POM score brings in data, some of which are already within those parameters, and uses that to predict which patients need the adherence intervention. All right, so we're validating that now with the, the retrospective data. Getting people to buy in to that sort of correlation, we're correlating it with both claims data and with 30-day readmission data. Um, that's the game starter for that. Uh, validating it with prospective data is going to be a long-term project, and, and so, and we get this sort of question a lot, but when FICO started, it wasn't validated either. And so it's one of these things that it's just going to take large numbers to validate it, but 
even as it stands, it's a score that has significant potential for motivating patients and allowing somebody to know how somebody's doing with the regimen. So regardless of its predictive capacity, it has an extreme functional value within the health ecosystem already. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I kind of see it looking like literally like your FICA score where you're probably going to have two or three companies where you probably have three different scores that you're going to you what, know, well, how would, that, how would you regulate your the know, score? The yeah, well, score. We, we, we get to control it, right? So we get to control the parameters of the score, right? Because right. that goes through our system. And so, and as you can imagine, since it's data in, data out, we have all the raw data, right? So even though somebody might set their parameters for when they want to be notified differently, we have all the data coming into the system that we can evaluate across the spectrum of all the clients that are coming into us about which things actually were predictive and non-predictive, even though they may be using it in a different context. Does that make sense to you? So, so we have the ability to standardize it, even though it functionally may be being used in different ways. In the interest of time, two more questions. We'll take a break. And so I'll get you, is it okay if I get you later? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. But, uh, two more questions. Okay. Your, your engagement, you mentioned gamification. Could you elaborate on that? And uh, how you engage? I saw a proprietary video teleconferencing aspect. So there's sort of, as you know, engagement's a huge sort of subject, right? When you say how you engage, so there are multiple sort of components of that. Um, so what I, what I mean by gamification and why I differentiated that from games. So yes, we're setting it up and we have designed various games. It's not the you can imagine that's where we started off. That's why our name is Play It Health. Um, but it's not the only sort of component that we offer now. So there are games that can interface with our system. The gamification component is literally just the ability for them to use their points to compete against others. So in other words, we have a game that we've already designed, a world health game. To our knowledge, the first MedWords game that actually came out in, the, in this sort of field. Um, but so in other words, we could have St. Louis University sort of transplant competing against Duke transplant with their adherence scores. Right? So that's the sort of things that we sort of envision you know, with the sort of gamification. Um, but as you know, there's, there's all sorts of permutations of that. And then the uh, communication that you do when you video teleconference, is that set up by the doctor, by the patient, by the a, to follow the appearance? How does it work? Well, so there's two different, well, actually even three different ways it can be used right now. So we interface with a single sign-on with a telecom, with a telehealth platform that just provides the platform. That's what we realized when we started going to these hospital divisions and these hospital systems. They already had their clinicians. They actually don't want things to go outside of their systems yet. I think they will when they realize that it's more cost effective for somebody else to take that initial adherence sort of call, but they're not there right now. They still, you talk to them, they still want everything coming into them. They haven't quite understood that. All right, so that's part one of what we sort of have. Um, but we also have uh, one of our previous board members is um, a broker for telemed sort of groups and he, he brokers services for five telemed groups that we can sort of mix and match telemed services should a given institution want that and not have the groups to stand behind them. And then more recently a behavioral health platform is actually going to take up and, and be a client of ours and so we have the ability to now offer that sort of service behind this if someone wants behavioral health or a therapist behind the, um, behind the platform. One last question for now. All right. Last question. So, uh, one question that comes to mind is looking at you know, some of the other people in the space, like Florida Health, the diabetes specific, and uh, how they actually went after employees and insurers. Mm -hmm. Because clearly, having a FICO score and allowing an employer to say, hey, look at my population, we brought using this software, we've been able to bring uh, adherence higher, so that we're going to be a better rate of my insurance. Sure. And because they gave us exactly what their model was. Sure. Um, truth be told, this particular solution, there's not a healthcare segment that we aren't applicable to. And so I used to list all of them, and I used to talk about all the different sectors. Um, we are in conversations with basic, with various sort of third party payers. Uh, our experience up to this point has been that really for wide adoption by one of those groups, um, that they want the pilots to be completed. I say that, but then last week we just had an innovation group from one of those um, third-party payers approach us. So 
you know, I think it's just one of those things, we weren't gonna hang our hat on that one, um, but, uh, you know, most definitely that's one of the ways that, you know, things are going in the behavioral health group that we talked about. They are actually selling our product to uh, an employer. So I agree, those are two, um, uh, you know, areas on the, on the board. It's just not where we're throwing the most of our marketing efforts right now until we get more data. Great, all right, thanks.